welcome all of the candidates to coming to, or the candidates for District 41, the Democratic primary. So I'd like to thank everyone for being here. And I would also like to thank City Hall for letting us be here. And this session will be rebroadcast on Fargo Channel 12. This is for the League of Women Voters, is a nonpartisan political organization that encourages informed and active participation in government, works to increase the understanding of major public policy issues, and influences pu public policy through education and advocacy. And everyone is welcome to join the League to become more involved, and we welcome you to visit our website to find more information about that. For this, each candidate will get two minutes to make an introduction, and then following that, we'll have questions from the audience, and they'll have two minutes to answer, and then at the end, we'll have a one-minute wrap-up. And for the two-minute introduction, I think we'll start with Lillian Jones. Good morning. My name is Lillian Jones, and I'm a District 41 Dem NPL endorsed candidate for the House of Representatives. I'm in this race because the people in my district and the state of North Dakota deserve authentic leadership that will put the best interest of the people above that of industry. I'm a native North Dakotan, born and raised in Bismarck. I was raised to be responsible to my community and do what needed to be done without being asked. When I moved to Fargo, my first stop was the Rape and Abuse Crisis Center to volunteer my services as an advocate. I know the need for and, for and the benefit of collaboration for best outcomes. I'm here because I've witnessed a series of attacks on the integrity of our state's, the state that's diminished our quality of life that we've taken for granted. The people in my district have not been adequately represented, and it's time to correct that. We're at a critical point in North Dakota with the opportunity to restore the integrity of our communities and ensure continued prosperity beyond this oil boom. The increase in frequency and severity of crimes in South Fargo and across the state demands that we direct adequate resources to law enforcement to ensure public safety. Expanding public education to include early education is an investment in our working families and the future of the, for North Dakota kids. Providing an excellent education will equip our students to succeed in the 21st century. Demanding accountability for safe workplaces and practices and ensuring every worker in the state of North Dakota is protected under the law is good business. If we say North Dakota is open for business, then we better do it right. I'm running to help restore balance in the legislature to protect the interests of the people in North Dakota and ensure a brighter future for our grandbabies. I've, I've come full circle in my life, from victim of violence to advocate for the abused. And I'd like to take my advocacy to Bismarck on behalf of District 41. Thank you. Sheila? I'm running for this position because I want to represent the people of District 41. And I want the people to choose their representation. My only allegiance will be to the people. You will find my qualifications and experience in my brochure on the table outside the door and on my website at www.christiansonforthehouse.com. My reasons for running are one, with rising costs of everything, we need to work to keep more of your money in your pocket. Two, I think we need a more balanced representation in the legislature. And three, having two daughters and a granddaughter, I'm concerned about the quality of life we are leaving them, both economically and as women. My family supports me 100%. Because I have a personal opinion does not mean I will not listen to you or consider yours. I respect my opposition and their interest in running. And I want to thank the League of Women Voters and those in the audience for attending this forum. I'm asking for your vote on June 10th. Thank you. Pamela? Hi, I'm Pamela Anderson, and I'm also an endorsed, endorsed candidate from District 41 Democratic MPL Party. And I grew up in Minnewaka, North Dakota, and then I went to UND and have two degrees, bachelor and master's in economics. I met my husband there, and we moved to Fargo. And so for the last 40 years, Fargo's been our home. Um, my husband started a uh, law practice, and I started work for U.S. Bank and then retired in 2005 as a senior vice president of Wells Fargo Bank. 
We raised three children here, Justin, Meredith, and Murphy. And they all graduated from South High. Um, and I, through the years, I've been very active in boards in the Fargo community. Um, Sanford Health System, I was president of Bethany, president of the Fargo Community Theater Board, on Prairie Public's board, uh, the, the YWCA. So um, our community and our state are growing. Oh, I need to get going. Ne um, needs changing. I think my background in economics and uh, my community involvement allows me to better represent the needs and wishes of the people of District 41. Our current representatives are simply out of touch. Al Carlson and Betty Grandy, they just spend their time grandstanding. Um, Al Carlson, I mean, he tried to bully the NCAA. That didn't work out so well. Um, Grandy passes unconstitutional legislation at the get-go. It doesn't take a banker to figure out colossal waste of money and time. So I can do better. So I want you to elect me in the primary and uh, I, I win in, in uh, November. How did I do, Barb? He didn't have to ring the bell. I'm so excited. <laughs> Thank you. And now we'll start with the questions. And for that, we will start with Sheila. And so the first question we have are, what are the top three spending priorities for you given the state's needs and the needs of your district? I think the top three priorities for me would be, um, number one, property tax relief. Um, number two, education, be it K through, or pre-K through secondary, um, and the higher education, and uh, flood control. Thank you. Pamela, same question to you. Um, definitely education and daycare. Um, permanent flood control would be important too. And then I, um, we need to spend some dollars on making sure that we've got a continued, educated, skilled workforce for our fastly growing economy in the state and in, and in Fargo. Thank you. Lillian? Let's see here. Where could I begin? Um, I think that one of the, my primary focus is ensuring a prosperity beyond the boom. Right now, we are in a critical position. We have the opportunity and the resources to invest in, in early education. And I think that one of my top priorities would be ensuring pre-K as a standard across the state, because those are valuable years that you're not going to get back. In addition to including that, you have a guarantee when it comes to early education, child care, um, and sustaining a future beyond, the, beyond K-12. Um, additionally, I think that we could afford to, um, to expand or in, increase or supplement our curriculum to include STEM, to infuse STEM into our early education the primary grades, and in high school. In addition to that, we have to think, you know, there's got to be a shift in our thinking when it comes to education and incorporating community and uh, or uh, uh, technical education in the 11th and 12th grade and also partnering with uh, state colleges would also ensure uh, success for higher education or the potential for our students. Um, additionally, the other uh, priority would be in law enforcement, and we have to address those issues that are new to North Dakota in the severity and the types of crimes that are being committed. We have strained law enforcement services, and especially out in the western part of the state. And I don't think that that's restricted there. It's also present in Fargo, within the city of Fargo, and the types and, uh, of crimes that we're seeing in the city. So uh, off the top, you know, it'd be two priorities. Thank you. And the next question, we'll start with Pamela. And for that is, is it time for the North Dakota legislat legislature to meet annually? You know, I don't know that, to be honest with you. Um, I think we could probably meet two times a year, provided we had 
a long-range plan and a vision for the state, which I don't think we have right now. I think we're very reactionary. Um, I, I think we need to set the biennium budget. We need to figure out what our rainy day funds are. And from there, we need to figure out how to invest the balance. And I, I think with proper planning and some vision, which I don't think our legislature has now, I'm not sure we have to meet every two years. But then maybe when I get out there, I, maybe we would have to meet every two years. But I, right now I'd say no. Thank you. Lillian. Definitely, it is definitely time, and I think we're a little beyond, uh, are behind in that regard. Um, to meet every other year right now at this point in time for the state of North Dakota and the rate of growth that we're experiencing, those changes, I think that it's definitely time for us to, to shift that schedule and get realistic with, um, with the scheduling and be able to better address those issues that are popping up. There's no way that we can adequately make plans for uh, sustained growth and not only sustained growth, but also retention of the people that are coming into the state. We rolled out a welcome mat for them saying, North Dakota is open for business. Come to North Dakota and build a life. Well, I want the people who are coming into this state to be able to stay and to be able to enjoy what we enjoyed coming up, growing up in the state of North Dakota. And, and there's only one way that I think that we can assure that, and that would be to give adequate attention to governing the state and not leave it to committee work you know, in alternate years. But thank you. Thank you. And Sheila. I believe with the growing demands of the state um, that we should meet annually and perhaps shorten the 80-day uh, session to 40 days every year. Uh, we have a lot of issues that come up that need immediate attention, and instead of spending the money on special sessions, um, I believe we should have um, a session every year. Thank you. And the next question we will start with Lillian, and that will be, how can the North Dakota legislature fairly distribute our oil windfall? I think one of the things that has to happen is that we have to focus on the areas most adversely impacted. Uh, okay, that's, that's an immediate and I'm, I, issue, and I'm really disappointed that that special legislative session that was called for to address those specific issues was just recently denied. It, and it's like, we cannot continue to receive the profits and benefit off the backs of people who are strained out in, in Western uh, North Dakota. And I think of our long-term residents, those permanent residents who've gone out there and who are sacrificing their quality of life, uh, the cost of living that they can no longer afford, the increased rents that are off the charts. I think that adequate attention has to be paid to, to, uh, to, that, to that area. And let's see here. I'm sorry, could you refresh the question for me right quick? How can the North Dakota legislature fairly distribute the oil windfall? Okay. Additionally, I think that w the other thing is when it comes to looking at those long-term uh, goals and needs that the people across the state have had to face. If you look at even uh, our property tax rates that are just a little ridiculous, quite frankly, when I see my neighbors in District 41, our elder neighbors having to sell their homes and I consider what are you know what's the what rates are they paying they can't afford to keep those homes that they work their lives to obtain and they should be able to rest in a measure of comfort and security so i think that that's another thing and additionally or finally we have to make sure that those areas within the state uh, that are threatened by floods say the red river valley that's a given and the devil's lake region we need to make sure that we can get something uh, a firm foundation for them to uh, continue unthreatened. Thank you. No bill. Sheila, the same question to you. How can the North Dakota legislature fairly distribute our oil windfall? I think there's no end to the uh, places that that money can be spent. Uh, but there's something I wanted to bring up. Um, have you ever heard of ALEC? Uh, it describes itself as a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization. There's currently one dem out of 104 legislators in the leadership positions of this organization. 
Through secret meetings, corporate lobbyists and members of state legislators vote as equals on model bills to change our rights that often benefit the corporation's bottom line at public expense. Less than 2% of ALEC funding comes from the membership dues of $50 per year paid by state legislators. Each corporate member pays an annual fee of $25,000 and depending on involvement. The organization boasts 2,000 legislative members and 300 or more corporate members. Representatives Al Carlson and Betty Grandy are both state chairmen and members of Alex's Tax and Fiscal Policy Task Force. ALEC also represents direct grants from some of the biggest foundations funded by CEOs such as the Koch Family Foundation, Coors, etc. ALEC's task, force, task forces vote on model bills and resolutions in a wide variety of topics and sit as equals with legislators vo voting on these model legislation. The long-term representation of Coke Industries on the governing board means that Coke has had influence over an untold number of Alex bills. Due to the questionable nature of this partnership with corporations, legislators rarely discuss the origins of the model legislation they bring home. I urge you to go online to www.alex.org and take a look for yourself. The supermajority doesn't seem to be running our state. Alex does. And there's, there's many, many um, topics to look at. Thank you. Pamela, the same question to you. How can the North Dakota legislature fairly distribute our oil windfall? Well, I, again, I think what we need to do is determine what our, our biennium budget is, determine what our rainy day fund would be, which could be very conservative, and then invest the rest um, in, in priorities of, I agree with Lillian, with flood control with um, uh, the infrastructure needs, the service needs, across the whole state, actually. Um, I think we also need to look at the, uh, the way that the formula works for the, how we share the extraction and the petroleum taxes. I think there are some counties that have huge oil production and don't have as many needs as other counties that don't have as much oil but have huge needs. Minot, Bismarck, um, uh, Fargo, um, and we don't really share in that tax. I do think, too, that we could make some one-time investments mm -hmm. every biennium that would, would add to the annual budget. So, um, and that could be various grants um, to communities so they could decide how to spend the dollars. I think one thing that we could look at to um, ensure a, a continued workforce is the, the Bank of North Dakota has, they know how to do stuff out there, that bank does, and they've got a great student loan program. And right now, this, the fixed rate is 5.25%, which we can get a home loan for less than that. I think we should look at Really, you come to North Dakota, you work here, you've got student loans. As long as you live and work here, you have no interest on your student loans. I think that would be great economic development, and that would be spending some of our state's resources. And that would be for every child with college education working in North Dakota, no matter where. <laughs> Thank you. And then from the next question, we'll start with Sheila, and I'm going to combine a few things that we have. Um, but basically, where do you stand on the state, the state's responsibility on regulating, like the rail industry and the or the oil industry due to the increased amount of incidents that have occurred? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear all of what you said. Where do you stand on the state regulating, or the state's responsibility and what they should do as far as oil, like for oil regulation and rail regulation, to increase safety? I believe it would be it should be a high priority uh, for the state with all the um, rail explosions of, uh, with oil content. Um, I heard yesterday that there was passed that the rails 
are going to invest a billion dollars in um, upgrading the tracks, um, et cetera. Um, the people need uh, to be safe. We can't have um, something that happened in Castleton happen in downtown Fargo. I think one, one thought might be given to if, if the upgrade in the cars and the rails um, isn't enough, perhaps it should be looked at having a, um, a rails that would go and skirt the city limits of Fargo, something outside where if there were an accident, it would be uh, not quite as catastrophic as it would be if it was in downtown Fargo. Thank you. Pam Willis, same question to you. I don't think the state can regulate uh, the railroad lines. I think that's a, a national um, government issue. But I, that doesn't mean we can't get involved with the railroads. And I think we can work with our uh, leadership in Washington to make sure that they're up to date, that enough money is funded so we're all safe. Um, I think what's going on in North Dakota, the entire country knows what's going on. And I think it's a tremendous opportunity for us to be able to work nationally to make sure that our railroads, our trucks, are that they're safe. And I, I don't think we can do it on our own. And um, uh, we've got pipeline issues. Um, that would help if we could get pipeline. But that again, that's a national issue. So I think we've got to come out of North Dakota a little bit and view ourselves where do we fit in the entire country and think a little bit more global than we do now. Thank you. Lillian. OK, I have to repeat the question for clarification. OK. okay. So I, I, I understood you to say, where do I stand on the state's responsibility for uh, rail safety and oil industry regulation mm -hmm. is that correct yeah I, okay I think that you know if if that's the if that's the issue and we look at the the benefit that we've received you know by and large from this state and it's because of that industry that caused the increased traffic right and it's also had a diminished uh, it has it's had an impact on our agricultural industry as well which has sustained us all this time. But I believe that because of that, if we're going to reap the benefits of that and, and that, uh, the increased demand and, and wear and tear on that, uh, on that system, that we have a duty to step up our game and make sure that if, the, you know, if we can partner effectively with the federal government to make sure that you know, repairs and the integrity of the rail system is maintained, not only that, but when it comes to the oil industry regulation, I think that it's an utter failure if we do not watch, our, uh, watch or guard our gates. Because that industry in and of itself has a great capacity or poses a great threat to what's sustained us once again all this time, which is agriculture, right? You think of North Dakota, it's ag. This is you know, my great grandparents and my grandparents were farmers and ranchers. We relied on the integrity of the land. And I think that if we drop our guard or if we fail to address that appropriately at the state level, then we do ourselves an injustice and we threaten the future and viability of the people in the state of North Dakota. Thank you. Um, the next question we're going to start with Pamela, and that will be concerns continue to be raised about property taxes. What solutions would you propose? That is a huge issue that is, I mean, the property taxes fund local government, local schools. So we have to make sure that whatever property tax reform, which I am all for, we need property tax reform. We have to have, we have to figure out how we can get property tax reform and still fund what the local governments need. And what's happening in a lot of communities, like you know, Lillian said, the value of our property is going up so significantly, and because of the way our property taxes are, figured, are computed, then the property taxes go up. So we need a system that's fair to the property owner, but then still 
make sure that there's enough money that is flowing back to take care of our schools and our cities and our police. It's a complicated issue, I'm, and I, we can figure it out, but it's going to take everyone working together um, on doing that. And, and I'm not sure, to be honest, we couldn't do work with the income tax so that you could get a reduction on your income tax for property taxes, which then wouldn't impact the, uh, um, the local funding of community issues and education. Needs to be done. It's not an easy problem to solve. Thank you. Lillian, solutions for property taxes. Well, okay, so there's this rainy day fund, right, in North Dakota, and it's raining. It's raining when we see our neighbors selling their homes. We see it, it you know, the, the rain coming down when people are forced out of their rented properties that, you know, the rates have gone up. So I think when it comes to property tax relief, we also have to broaden that scope and include the impact that it's had, that the, that the cost of living has had on our renters, our temporary and even our permanent residents in the state of North Dakota. And when those funds are being directed or allocated to this, this abyss that, you know, we're really, in, we're really unsure of that, that final dollar amount, the actual amount that's being held in reserves, I think that there has to be a balance between the, the taxes that the oil companies are going to go ahead and, and get a break on when it goes to, okay, let's take these extraction taxes and pump them out of the, out of the state so they can make their profit and still re maintain a stress for the homeowners and those people who are living within the state. I think that if anything, our property taxes or those rates can actually be reduced at, to while the oil companies are required to, you know, step up their game. There's a demand, they're, they're meeting their demand, they're getting a profit off the state of, uh, of North Dakota, and I think that we owe it to our permanent citizens and those people we want to invite to stay within this state uh, to have a, a, a fair shot at a sustainable future. Thank you. Sheila? Uh, property tax relief for homeowners and apartment uh, owners uh, is a high priority for me. Uh, they talk about the rent in Williston being uh, $1,400 a month. Well, my rent in Fargo is $1,300 a month, and it's going up. Uh, renters who live by me have started moving because their rents are going up anywhere from $25 to $100 a month. Uh, the Senate Republicans rejected $250 million in property tax reduction in favor of corporate and personal income tax cuts that the voters had already rejected. It would have reduced property taxes by 12.5%. They had a whole year to come up with a property tax relief plan, and they waited until day 80, the last day of the session, to come up with something. Um, I think we can do a lot better than that. Instead of concentrating on uh, logos and things like that, we should be concentrating on the things that would benefit the citizens. Thank you. And the next question, we're going to start with Lillian. And I'm going to co combine a few on the topic of education. Um, specifically, what is your opinion of the core stan standards of education? And do you feel early education should be a priority? I think that if you focus on core standards, I think you're really eliminating a lot of um, uh, a lot of options. When when I think of where we need to be in the quality of education, not only do I fully believe that we need to add and incorporate that early education system, but we need to be able to carry that all the way through to higher ed. We're in a unique position within the state of North Dakota to achieve that, and I think that. Uh, by, by focusing on that sustained growth from basically from the cradle through adulthood. That's, that's something that, could be, that we, can, we can and we have to do. And the, the shift that has to take place is to get our minds out of the Dick and Jane mindset. That was fine for us when we were younger, but right now this is the 21st century and we really need to prepare our students to succeed in that, in, in that era. It's, it's something that's taken what we've taken for granted and what we were given and elevated it, uh, you know, it exponentially. 
So I think that that's where we need to be. And in order to achieve that, uh, that level of growth and the level of expectation and make sure that our students and our young people are competitive, not only globally, but that they can sustain uh, a solid foundation right here in this state that we, you know, call home. Thank you. Sheila. Could you repeat the question? Yes. What is your opinion of the core standards of education, and do you feel early education should be a priority? I believe that um, early education is, is a priority. It does need to be a priority. They, um, the children need to start learning as early as possible. Uh, if they can work cell phones and remotes for games on on their television, they can certainly start learning in the classroom. Um, in order for our children to tr keep up with the world in science and math, I think we need to start l learning those things earlier as well. Um, the funding for uh, pre-K and public education needs to be uh, made a priority. Uh, there was a defeat which fund, uh, of HB 1319, which funded elementary and second, secondary schools throughout North Dakota, which stem, demonstrates how the GOP supermajority are failing the citizens of North Dakota at the direction of Al Carlson and his followers. Um, I think that we need to make a priority also of children being able to have uh, their milk at their, at their snack breaks and not have um, lunches taken away from in front of them and thrown in the garbage, which has happened in some of the schools. Um, our children are our most important resource, and if we don't take care of them here, they are going to leave the state. Thank you. Pamela? Yes, to early childhood education. Every study shows that it makes a significant difference on their lives throughout, I mean, their entire life. And for the life of me, I can't figure out why the last legislature didn't fund more early childhood education. You know, we're, we're in a, a state with not a lot of people, with a lot of resources. I mean, we could say that every child that enters fourth grade will be able to read and make that happen. Um, we need to put, with early childhood, I think we go all the way through. Um, there's, sig there's studies that show our, our kids in North Dakota are really not ready for post high school. And the current legislature, I mean, I don't even know that they care about education. They want to get rid of now the higher board of education, put in a three people that are paid to do this. We need to completely redo the thought process of the supermajority in Bismarck that says our kids are important to us, whether they're one years old or whether they're six months or they're 10 or they're 15. Um, it's a cultural thing of, I guess we're supposed to not work, stay home with kids. Like Lillian said, it's a whole different deal. Um, I don't understand it, and yes, it should be an absolute priority for dollars. Yeah. And daycare needs to go with it, too. Thank you. And the next question, we're going to start with Sheila, and that is kind of a follow-up. How can we ensure that North Dakota continues to attract young educated workers to the state? I think that a way to attract young educated workers um, would be offering better opportunities for better paying jobs, um, for establishing entrepreneurship uh, that's attractive to people um, coming from out of state. I think that it goes along with the um, higher education here. Uh, we need to have the best education we can uh, to uh, 
make the people who are taking classes want to stay here after they graduate. Uh, currently, North Dakota is uh, ranked 13th in the average debt load carried by its students and is ranked number one for the number of students leaving college with debt. I think that's uh, something that's important is giving people an opportunity to uh, graduate and not have a bill, a monthly bill that, that ranks up there with your house payment. Uh, I would propose a bill to keep oil extraction taxes and allocate a portion of that money to assist those students with student loan debt so much per year to help pay down their debt, especially those in forbearance. Another idea would be online textbooks um, that can be purchased and downloaded at a cheaper price. Textbooks uh, prices have become outrageous. North Dakota leads the nation with 83% of students who graduate from college with an average of $27,000 in debt. So let, uh, let's put our heads together and come up with a solution to the problem. Thank you. Pamela, how can we ensure that North Dakota continues to attract young educated workers? Well, I still like my idea of not having any interest on student loans as long as they live and work here. Um, I also think if I was a young educated worker and I looked at some of the um, unconstitutional bills that came out of uh, the legislature regarding women's health last year, I'm not sure as a young woman I would move to the state of North Dakota. I think um, we need not to do that. Um, we also need to make sure that when the un young educated workers come, that we have um, a system in place that our state is a vibrant, wonderful place to work with great roads, great highways, great schools for their kids, great parks, um, everything that a young family wants. Um, and we can do that. And we've got, and our jobs are not just in the oil fields. Our jobs are Microsoft, they're high tech, they're research jobs. We have to make sure that, that we've got a system in place where our, co our colleges and higher ed are working with our students to make sure that what they're learning is what they can use to stay in North Dakota. So um, I, th I just think there's a lot of very creative people all over the state that can help us figure this out. And um, I don't think our current legislature, are, they're too narrow focused. They don't have a vision. They're just, I don't know, like I say, I don't even think they care about education, to be honest with you. Thank you. Lillian, the same question. How can we ensure that North Dakota continues to attract young educated workers? I think at the top of that list would be to make the state welcoming by law. And that means by ensuring the protection for those people who come into this, uh, to the state to contribute their skills and talents, to make sure that they are protected by law, that every worker in the state of North Dakota is, has those, pro those protections, that security. Ensuring the protection of individual rights within this state and not allowing the abusive majority to go ahead and continue that threat um, on the quality of life. Keeping crime low. That's one of the things that we enjoyed as North, Dakotas, North Dakotans. We could keep the door unlocked. You know, we didn't have to worry about those threats that have come into the state. And that's one of the, you know, one of the, um, the factors when you think about young people and starting a family. Why would you want to live and raise a family in a threatening environment? You can't do that. Um, be innovative. The, the state of North Dakota can invest in entrepreneurial endeavors and allow those people, those talented, educated people who want to come into the state to go ahead and, and you know, elevate the game just to, to be innovative and to uh, inspire our young people through 
you know, creative thinking and, and make that w a welcoming environment. Make home ownership uh, a possibility. We look at the, the level of student debt that people have, that these educated people have, and the thought, the very thought that they should take, uh, that, that should be a granted, that you go out and you get your education, you can go ahead and get yourself a home. You can have that measure of security where you can raise your, your family. But right now, that's a big threat with, you know, with uh, the level of student debt that these people have. I think that we could um, find a way to accommodate that within the state of North Dakota by letting them make that investment here in, in the state and reinstate or restore the protection or the, uh, or that we had you know, coming up in the quality of life that we enjoyed and that we took for granted right here. If we bring that back up and you know, elevate that to where it was before uh, or as close as we can get, I think that we stand a good chance. Thank you. The next question, we're going to start with Pamela, and that will be, would you support legislation to add LGBT as a protected status? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> I, don't, I don't need two minutes for that. <laughs> Lillian. Definitely. I think that that's one of the, the greatest inhibitors. How is it that anybody should have to live a life? I'm sorry. It's infuriating when you think that the right to life and dignity and respect could be so easily diminished. I think it's clear where I stand, <laughs> definitely. Thank you. Go. Sheila. I think uh, being against any other uh, group other than the white people are, uh, or, you know, different races, ethnicities, uh, lifestyles, I think it's discrimination and we can't hold for discrimination. So that's what I think. Thank you. And the next question, we are going to start with Lillian. Okay. <laughs> um, right. How do you feel about the legislative control of guns? The legislative control of guns? Yes. I think that, well, I, I fully believe in the right to, to protect uh, your home and your family. This is North Dakota. We're hunters. You know, this is part of who we are, you know, and that, that's a right. But that's also, a, you know, something that you have to guard. When it comes to the level, of the types of weapons that are out there, I think that's where we need to start paying attention. And I don't, I know that there's a lot of, of uh, flack when, when people think of gun regulation and the threat they're going to come and take my guns. I don't think that that's, uh, that makes any sort of sense. What I consider are the number of children who are lost every year. You don't get them back. So when it comes to you know gun control and safety, that's something that I don't think anybody could could uh, argue against. We can be smart, and we can be you know the people that we have been in enjoying outdoors uh, out outdoor sports. But again, we have to put safety first and be smart about it, and not be threatened by fear-mongering or scare tactics or being manipulated into they're going to take our guns. No, I think that we owe it to ourselves and our children, our grandchildren, to take a, a broad look at, at uh, gun, gun control and just be smart. Thank you. Sheila? I come at this issue from uh, the self-protection angle. Um, growing up, I was a very shy person, um, did not party, did not drink, didn't have a drink till I was 21 years old. At age 20, I was a victim of domestic violence that I was terrorized and held at gunpoint for 24 hours and more uh, than I have time to talk about here. At 20, age 21, while living with my parents, my one-year-old daughter was kidnapped and I didn't know where she was for two months. At age 28, my brother, uh, two years my junior, was murdered near Mandan. He disappeared on April Fool's Day, and his body was not found until Father's Day in the Missouri River. His killers were never found. At age 32, I was running for office and had all four new tires on my car slashed. At age 40, I was running for public, uh, working for a public defender, and a drugged-up woman twice my size came into the office physically terrorized my boss and I and threw his, uh, my boss's wife through a glass door. After that, on the job, I had to sit alone 
um, with people later convicted of murder and rape. Uh, police then suggested to me that I, can, that I get a gun permit and put a gun in my desk uh, in the drawer, and so I did. Um, I think that no matter if you're a nice person or one that skirts the law, there are times in your life when you need uh, some kind of protection. And so I am for the uh, Second Amendment. Thank you. Pamela. Well, I would like us to just start with background checks. And maybe if, I mean, we're all going to, the gu guns are going to be, I mean, we're all going to have guns. I mean, not we're all, I don't have a gun, but I mean, um, <laughs> I don't have a problem with guns, rifles, shotguns. I, what I have a problem with is no background checks. And I think with background checks, I can't tell you how many young mothers we may save across the country because their ex-husbands or their current husbands have restraining orders and there is no way that they should have a gun and show up at their wife's workplace and shoot her and everyone else. So I would really, I would work hard to get background checks in the state of North Dakota if I got elected to go to Bismarck. That would be, that would be a goal of mine. Thank you. And now we're going to wrap up and give each candidate one minute for closing remarks, and then we'll start with Sheila. Uh, Representatives Carlson and Grandy support spending big money on UND logo fight and untold amounts of money on bills that they knew were unconstitutional, not to mention the time wasted in session on these matters. I would not do that. They lead the charge and voted to cut the oil extraction tax. That is not the best interest of North Dakota. They neglected our children and their education's health and well-being. I would be their advocate. They voted against funding property tax relief. I would make it a priority. I have 40 years of broad-based experience and am a lifelong resident here. I would make you and your pocketbook my priority. And I ask for your vote on June 10th. Thank you. Thank you. Pamela? I think the, the Republicans are going to, their message is going to be, the state is doing great. Why change anything? Why vote for anybody? Send us all back. We're doing a great job. State's doing super. Well, not really. And, and if, um, if I got elected, I mean, you could expect more from me on economic development and workforce. You could expect more from me on education and daycare. You could expect more in property tax reform. You could expect more in permanent flood control. What we need to do in District 41, and I ask for your vote for the primary, we need to end the arrogance and restore balance. Thank you. Lillian. Well, thanks again for coming out on a Saturday morning. I appreciate that. It, it shows me, you know, that you're concerned, and so am I, and that's why I'm up here. And I didn't enter this race because I thought it would be an easy thing to do. I did this because somebody has to step up, and I'm willing to do that. I'm a lifetime uh, North Dakota resident, and this is my home. And unlike, you know, people who could just pick up and go ahead and, and leave the state, for a more secure and welcoming environment, I think that we owe it to the people in our state, to our children and our grandchildren, to make sure that that's what we grew up with is is offered to them as well. And I don't, you know, I, I literally wake up in the middle of the night with the thought that Al Carlson and Betty Grandy could get back into office, and that, like I said, it wakes me in the middle of the night, <laughs> and 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 I, I just can't. I can't not do this, but thanks again. June 10th, our primary, uh, and I can't, again, allow our, our uh, supermajority here uh, to rest in the fact that we may not show up at the polls. You gotta be there. Thank you. 
Thank you, and I'd like to thank all of the candidates for being here and everyone who has attended and everyone who'll be, who will be re-watching re the broadcast on Channel 12. Also, thank you to City Hall. And again, if anyone is interested in joining the League of Women Voters, please find us on the web. Thank you for being here. And thank you. Thank you for moderating. Nice job.